All right, boys, and we are back. And today we're looking at this handsome Atari Lynx. This is the Model 2, so this is the second generation Lynx, and it is in absolutely pristine condition. I briefly showed you guys this console in an unboxing video a couple of weeks ago, and um, I picked it up in a recent trip to the UK. I bought it for 70 pounds on eBay and it was advertised as not working. There was really no other information in the listing about why it wasn't powering on. Now, the system didn't come with any games. So when I came back to the US, I picked up a couple on eBay. I think I got both of these together for less than $25. And uh, they are box games, but uh, the boxes are in pretty rough shape. There's nothing really special about the games I picked up, Viking Child and Crystal Mines 2. But it was nice to find out that games for the Lynx are not terribly expensive, so it was good to be able to pick up a couple of games without over-investing and finding out if I can actually get this thing working again. One of the unique things about the Atari Lynx in terms of handhelds is that it can be played in a couple of different orientations. So you'll notice that there's a flip option in the buttons here. So the system can be played like this, or it can be rotated and played upside down. I already knew this about the Lynx before I bought it. I had seen it in other YouTube videos in the past and people talked about being able to flip the system upside down. But what I did not know is that you can actually play the system vertically like this. In preparation for this video, I downloaded an online version of the manual and apparently there are games that are specifically designed to be played vertically with the Lynx. So they can be played with the D-pad towards the bottom or the reverse with the buttons towards the bottom. Pretty creative, if you ask me. You certainly can't fault Atari for thinking outside the box with the Lynx, but I suppose if you get a little bit too carried away, then bad things can happen. All right, guys. Now, the system runs on 9 volts, so you either feed it 9 volts center positive via an external power supply, or you just give it six double A's. So we'll go ahead and try both. Let me grab six batteries, and we'll try and turn this thing on. I have a couple of packs of brand new batteries over here. Let's pop in a cartridge and try to turn it on. And nothing. I'd also like to try feeding it nine volts externally. So let me find a small barrel jack to test this guy out. Let's find a connector in my little stash here. Oh, that works. There's a nice long cable right there. Mm, this guy's a little tight. All right, this one works much better. We should be getting nine volts and that is nine volts center positive. Batteries are out. Let's try it using the DC jack and power on. And nothing. Okay. Something I'm noticing is that the on button right here is actually quite squishy. It doesn't feel as good as the rest of these. If you look at this button right here, and this one's just completely like depressed in there. So we'll definitely have to look into that. That'd be pretty sweet if the only thing wrong with this was the button. All right, let's go ahead and open this guy up. Our screws are all hiding underneath these rubber side grips. I've gone ahead and taken out the hot air. I've set it to 100 Celsius, so it should be a relatively safe temperature to briefly hit the plastic with. I just want to soften up the adhesive long enough that I can easily remove the side grips and reapply them later. All right, that's one. Perfect. Let's do the other side. Amazing. Let's separate the two halves. We have a screw over here to release the battery compartment. So let's go ahead and take that guy out. Okay. So next, it looks like we have a few connectors here that we need to release to reveal the main side of the board. Okay. 
let's get this guy in the board holder and take a closer look. Now, first glance, the board looks pretty clean. Um, the only thing that's kind of jumping out at me is that this capacitor is different from all the rest. And what's the brand on this guy? Sam Hua. Yeah, something tells me that wasn't originally in there. I mean, in all likelihood, there's been a prior repair attempt on this board. And um, there's definitely some staining on the back. Now, I'm not sure if that's corrosion or flux. It could be residue from leaking batteries. Yeah, all this white stuff here. Hmm. I do think there's been a prior repair attempt on this board. There's a tiny little solder blob right there. Yep. It's not the end of the world, but that almost automatically minimizes my odds for success. Okay, before I feed the board power, I'm gonna go ahead and just wipe the back down. I don't like the look of all the residue that's back here, and then we'll plug it into power and start probing around the board. All right, that's automatically looking 10 times better. Really doesn't take much. All right, let's feed this guy nine volts. So the first thing that I'd normally check is the power connector. In this particular case, we've already tested the system with batteries and it doesn't power on. So it's highly unlikely that this is a power connector issue. In anticipation of this project, I purchased some power related components to refurbish the power circuitry on the motherboard. And that kit essentially replaces several of the components in this area right here. So it comes with a new MOSFET, a new Zener diode, this guy right here that says D13, and two new transistors, all of which are part of the main power circuit. Let's go ahead and probe for voltage across some of these power-related components. So I'm going to go ahead and just use this shield for ground. And on this MOSFET right here, we can see there's an S and a G for source and gate. So let's see if we get anything across G. So we get negative 8.7, that's almost 9 volts. And what about across S? Negative 8.7. All right, let's unplug this guy from power for a moment. And let's put the meter in continuity mode. And I just want to check if there's a short across this diode. It is not shorted. Um, let's keep it in regular diode mode and see if we get a voltage drop across the diode. 0 0.025, okay. And what about the other way around? 0 0.025. Hmm. So I know the kit that includes this component says that this is a Zener diode, and I'm not gonna pretend to know what I'm talking about here, but we're getting roughly the same value both ways, and that doesn't sound right. Okay. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and grab that uh, component kit that I purchased and replace some of these power-related components on the board and see if that resolves our issue. All right, guys, I'm all set up here. Now, this is the kit that I purchased, and let's take a look at what we have in here. So this is that Zener diode, replacement power jack. This is that MOSFET that I was probing the two little transistors. And I think we have a resistor and what's this guy? Oh, this is an SMD diode, nice. So I guess they give you two options for the diode, probably if you have a Lynx 1 or a Lynx 2. So we'll definitely just use the SMD one. So I'm pretty certain that this diode is gonna be our culprit. And if it's not, it's gonna be a step in the right direction. From everything that I've read online, when you have a no power condition on your links. These are really the first two components that you should examine. Both my iron and hot air are set to 350. All right, let's go in with the hot air. All right. All right, guys, I'd like to quickly probe this component while it's out of circuit. I don't know why I would see anything different than 
when it was attached, but let's just double check. I'm going to probe it in one direction, 0.35 volts, and let me go ahead and reverse the leads, 0.3 volts. So we definitely have a bad diode over here. Okay, let's go ahead and clean up these pads, a little bit of flux, and let's go in with the solder wick. All right, guys, so you'll notice our replacement diode has a black stripe on one side, right here. That's our cathode, so that's going to be this right pad over here facing the shield. Let's grab this guy and set him down. Let's go ahead and tack that first side in. All right, little dab of flux. And let's go ahead and do the other side. I guess it's worth a test, although something tells me that we might have more going on here. The only thing that's not connected is the speaker, and that's definitely not critical to test this guy out. So let's press the on button. Nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, now I did see a repair video on one of these where you can simulate the system being turned on by shorting the pins on the ribbon connector for the buttons. So let's try and do that just to eliminate that squishy button compounding the confusion here. So one, two, three, four, this guy and this guy. Nothing. I think every time I try and power on the unit to test, I will also short the two pins on the front panel connector to manually turn the system on. That way, if it turns out that there is indeed an issue with the squishy power button, um, at least it won't mask any repairs that we succeed in doing on the board. Now, at this stage, I'd like to continue swapping components on the power circuit. So I'm gonna go ahead and swap out this MOSFET and these two little transistors. All right, let's go in with the hot air. All right. Let's clean up and get ready to retin the pads. A little bit of flux. I think everything here went on okay. They look pretty good. All right, um, let's connect it to power and see if the reading across the MOSFET is any different from what it was before. All right, let's give it nine volts. And what do we get now? So on this side, same as before. On that side, same as before. And on this side, same as before. I'm not sure why it would turn on now, um, given most of the readings are the same. I guess the only thing that I'm not checking it before and after is these two transistors. So if one of these was the problem, we might see some life. Let's feed it power. Let's pop in a cartridge and try to turn it on. Nothing. 
nothing. What? Hey! Okay, well, there's a light on the screen. It's not loading anything though. It's just a backlight. Well, nothing's working on the front panel, I guess. Hmm. I kind of want to connect the speaker because if there's sound, then it tells me it's loading the game. Okay, the speaker is connected. Hmm, nothing. All right, guys. Well, some progress is better than no progress. At least we're seeing some signs of life, which is good. I want to see what the, the deal is with this button. I'm wondering if it might be kind of like stuck in the down position and that's why it's disabling the whole board. All right, and there's our screen. Now the power button is this guy right here, and on this side it looks fine. Well, it feels nice and clicky over here. So taking a closer look at the front panel ribbon cable, there's definitely signs of wear on the bottom. I don't think these buttons are our biggest issue though. All right guys, there's one more thing I'd like to try and that's replacing resistor R74. That's this guy right here. It's right next to the three components that we replaced a short while ago. Now, this was a part of the power component kit and the reason I didn't install it is because it said it was optional. Not all links units need it. Now, in very small print, I can read the three numbers on that resistor and it does say 121. And if I measure the resistance, it is indeed 120 ohms, 123. And uh, the resistor that we're replacing it with is only 30 ohms. And that's supposedly going to up the circuit voltage just a little bit. And some of these units are apparently a little bit picky about that. So we have nothing to lose at this point. It was part of the kit. I'm just going to go ahead and install it and see if we have any different behavior. We have swapped out that resistor. Now let's see if that had any impact at all. Let's feed it nine volts and let's go ahead and manually turn this thing on. And I think we're getting the same symptoms as before, just a black screen. So it is powering up, but there's nothing on the screen. All right, guys, I made a little bit of progress off camera. Not much, though. I basically just showered all the ports with contact cleaner, the cartridge port and both the ports for the LCD and the buttons. And the only thing that's changed is that it is now turning on with the press of the on button. So I no longer have to short the two pins on the back, but nothing at all has changed in terms of what we're seeing on the screen. So we're still just getting a black screen. I've carefully removed both the connector brackets, I've examined all the pins, I've showered them with contact cleaner, and while that didn't really resolve our issue, we started seeing a little bit of life from the front buttons. I'm a little bit torn where we go from here. The system has already been recapped. I wasn't 100% sure when I was doing the initial inspection, but having taken a closer look at the board, the manufacturer of these caps, we have Sam Hua, we have Jamicon, we have Tycon over here. These are not original to the board. So the system has been recapped. I've gone around and checked all the capacitor values. They're all correct. They're all installed the right way. And while it's not a terrible solder job, the low quality capacitors aside, I did find little solder blobs on the board. Um, we found one during the initial inspection and even taking a closer look at this board, there's like a little piece of copper right here. So there are examples like that where I'm concerned that there's something shorting out that I still haven't spotted. And that's why the system is just completely refusing to start up. All right, guys, the soldering gun is out and I'm gonna recap the board. 
I'm not quite sure what I'm going to gain by recapping it again, but maybe I'll just notice something in the prior recap attempt while I'm doing it myself. I already have a capacitor kit for the system and I've gone ahead and printed out a board diagram from console five and I've filled them out with all the right values just to help me stay organized. All right, guys, let's do this. All right, great. Let's go ahead and pop all the capacitors in, being mindful of the orientation. All right, guys, all the capacitors are in the board. I'm just gonna make sure to spread their legs and then flip the board over. All right, let's clean up and see how we did. I'd like to replace this pair of double-sided insulation pads. This is the closest thing I could find that I have. These are double-sided mounting pads and they're a little bit thicker than the original, but I think they're gonna do the job just fine. Let's go ahead and solder the shield back in place. And we are done. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit nervous. All right, guys, moment of truth. Let's turn this thing on. God damn it. Just a black screen. Let me try the other game cart. I heard a crackle from that speaker this time. Hmm, nothing. All right, guys, I think we have sadly reached the end of this journey on this repair, at least for now. Um, I've done just about everything I can think to do for this console. And while it is a little bit more alive than it was when I got it, it's still not working. So I do think we had a couple of faulty components here on the power circuit, uh, specifically the Zener diode, which was testing bad out of circuit. And um, even after replacing it, it wouldn't power up until I swapped out the MOSFET and two transistors. It's not a capacitor issue either. We've ruled that out. I didn't really think that was going to make a difference, but I think it would have just kept nagging away at me had I not just recapped it and just found out for myself. At this point, I don't even really suspect the screen or the cartridge port or the games. I think it might be one of the two proprietary chips that are underneath the shield. I'm going to table this project for now. I absolutely hate giving up, but uh, I need another avenue to investigate. At this point, I think I've done everything that I can for this board. So if you guys know something I don't, let me know. You can't fix them all. That's what happens when you buy broken junk on eBay. It's just part of the game. So um, hopefully we'll have a little bit more success in the next project. Take care guys. And I will see you again soon.